All right, it is 12.30, so we will get started. Um, so all the tests have been graded now. And again, I apologize for the delay of waiting until Sunday for that. Um, and you should be able to see your test. If you can't, let me know. I thought I, I made that available to everyone. Um, and your lowest score for your test have been updated. So if test three was your worst test, that one should be dropped. Um, if not, then I didn't touch it. Um, just be sure to uh, double check that. Um, I have messed that up uh, once or twice. So just double check my work to make sure I dropped the right test for you. Um, yeah, if you have questions about the test, um, feel free to look, look it over. I believe the answer should be shown for you um, and we can discuss it from there. Um, overall, I think people did uh, better on this test than as a group than either test one or two. So that's good. Um, so just a little business. I know we just had a test last week, Tuesday. Um, but because of that winter storm that knocked out a week and the university didn't give us that week back, just said deal with it, um, we're going to have another test crammed right up against, uh, against us. So um, next week, Thursday, it's our last test. Um, and I think there's only going to be like five lectures on it. So hopefully not too much stuff. Um, and the reason why I'm still keeping this fourth test instead of like saying, ah, well, I'll just add it on to the final. Because I do want you to have a chance to look at all the material, be tested on the material, see what type of questions I'm going to ask about the material before we get to the final. Uh, and just as a reminder, the final is cumulative. Um, for the final, uh, since this class doesn't have an official date, and I just picked Tuesday and Thursdays, 12.30 to 1.45, um, because that's like when it's usually held during in-person classes. Um, what we'll probably do is I'll probably allow you to take it either Thursday or Friday, May 8th slash May 9th. So, or if you really wanted to do it on May 7th, I can probably make that work too. But in general, I'm gonna open it up uh, May 8th and May 9th for people to take. Um, so yeah, um, cumulative, no outside notes, all that good stuff. May 8th or May 9th sounds good. That's good. Um, the, the only reason why I said like it could be available May 7th is if somebody's taking like four online classes and everybody's just says, eh, you can you can take it like on May 8th or May 9th just to spread it out a little bit. All right. So with that, let's actually get into our, our lecture for today and not too long. So it probably won't take the whole time, but you never know. Uh, if it's either 8th or 9th will be a particular time. Nope, I'll probably just leave it open for 48 hours. Um, take it when it's convenient to you. Um, and I believe you get like two and a half hours to do it too. Um, so yeah, make sure you do that. And we did have an issue for last test, test three. So I'll, I'll just reiterate. Don't put my questions on Chegg. I checked Chegg. And I'm not too happy when I find my test on Chegg. And you will get a zero for the final and you will fail this class if you do that. So just a heads up. All right. So with that, let's, let's move on then. And what we're gonna talk about now is RNA transcription. So in our previous lectures, and I apologize for not remaking a lecture for Thursday, um, it just felt weird to like have those videos out and then make another video where I talk to myself, where it's like, oh, you already have this. So um, I like the option of being able to talk to students. That's why we do this, this 
different session. Um, so previously, we were talking all about DNA. And on Thursday, we were talking about homologous N uh, junctions, holiday junctions, basically how to repair double-stranded DNA breaks, which is a big problem uh, for cells. Here, we're strictly going to talk about how to make RNA from DNA. And we're going to talk about RNA transcription or RNA polymerases. So to begin with, we're going to start with the E. coli version because that version is simpler, but there's a lot of crossover to the eukaryotic version. So we're going to start with the prokaryotic version, then move on to the eukaryotic version. And so the enzyme we're looking at is called RNA polymerase or RNAP, um, which creates RNA from DNA. This compound's very big, 450 kilodaltons, um, with um, a bunch of different subunits. So it has two alpha subunits, a beta, beta prime, omega, sigma, right? So it's a lot of proteins that come together to form one giant protein. And the picture there is in the middle. And it says, it's like, the book says it looks like a crab claw. Um, to me, it kind of looks like a boar's head. You know, there's a nose, there's a little ear, there's a mouth, but whatever works, right? It, it's basically just uh, uh, two pincers and opening. And the eukaryotic version looks very much the same. In the image we're looking at, green and blue here, that's our DNA. So that gets fed into the channel. And this is a cartoon version that's a lot easier to see, right? So here it's blue and black, here it's blue and green. So DNA is getting fed into the channel. Then you have magnesium. So magnesium right there, there's also one right there. And this magnesium is right at the active site where new nucleotides can come in. And you're gonna be making this RNA-DNA hybrid molecule where RNA is gonna be uh, double-stranded, or not double-stranded, hydrogen bond to DNA. So here, the red is our RNA. And you can see there is some red green overlap happening right in the middle where we're making that strand. However, the goal is not to make, um, you know, DNA RNA hybrid. We just want RNA. So we have, and we'll look at this in the prokaryotic or eukaryotic version more, but there's a little piece of this enzyme that sticks out like a wedge that separates the DNA from the RNA. So the RNA can leave out one channel. The DNA that was serving as the template goes out the other channel. And then we reform our double-stranded DNA. So that's basically, you know, the, the very coarse overview of RNA polymerase, what it's doing and like kind of just basically how it does it. Like I said, when we look at the eukaryotic version, we're gonna talk about this mechanism more in depth. Um, but just to give you an idea of how big this is, these things are the protein. So we can actually see this protein with a microscope. Most proteins, you can't, right? You can see ribosomes, right, with a microscope, but you can also see these things. So they're, they are just massive, massive, massive structures, right? So that's the overall basis of RNA polymerase or the overall structural look. Now let's see how RNA polymerase decides where to make RNA. And that's due to uh, initiation sites that have sequences called promoters. So a promoter is just simply a conserved sequence of DNA and they bind to a sigma factor. So I'm just gonna go back a slide here. So here we're talking about sigma, 
there are multiple sigmas on RNAP and they can each bind to a different uh, um, uh, promoter. If we just look at, <clears throat> excuse me, if we look at all the promoters like taken together, we can see there's some kind of consensus at the minus 35 region. So these numbers are telling you like nucleotides from starting to make RNA. And it starts at plus one, there's no zero. So it goes plus one, then minus one, all the way out to minus whatever or plus 100 or plus whatever. So plus one's where we start. So minus 35 nucleotides from where we start, uh, there's a consensus sequence, TTGACA. These numbers are probabilities. Like, so in minus 35 from where you're gonna start RNA transcription, you know, 69% of the time there's a T followed by another T, you know, 79% of the time. Then minus 10 from where we start, it's called the Primbal box or the Teta box because it's T-A-T-A-A-T, -A 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 -T, right? So that's also conserved. And then looking at the initiation site, uh, the number uh, is cut off for you, but I'll say G42. So what this is saying is that 51% of the time where we start um, making our RNA, it's going to be an A. 42% of the time, it's going to be a G. So if we just do some quick math, 51 plus 42 equals 93. So only 7% of the time is it not an A or G at the plus one site. To the right, roughly half the time, it's going to be a T. So that's at the plus two site. And at the minus one site, you know, 50% of the time, it's going to be a C. So you can see that starting RNA um, transcription is conserved. Um, we want those nucleotides not to change all that much. It can tolerate some change, um, but it's mostly conserved. Now, where these sequences are, they are found on the sense strand, right? So that's where we're actually binding to our, our sigma factor, which is what's binding to our promoter, is binding to the sense strand. However, we are not making, we are not using the sense strand to make our RNA. We're using the anti-sense uh, anti strand. And you can see here, I have coding and non-coding. So the question I have here is, if we're copying the anti-sense strand or we're using our anti-sense strand as a template, why is it called the non-coding strand? Why is the sense strand, which we're not using as a template, called the coding strand. And to help, imagine this is my double-stranded DNA, right? So we'll call this sense we'll call those anti-sense. So my sense goes T-A-G-C, so my anti-sense would go A-T-C-G. So if I'm using my anti-sense as a copy or as my template, my RNA, let's do that in red, my RNA would have the sequence of well, T, well, it wouldn't be T, it'd be U, A, G, C, which is the exact same as the sense. So that's why even though we're not, you know, using the sense as a template, we're using the anti-sense, the RNA we make is the same as the coding strand, same sequence. 
So that's just uh, one of the naming things in case you were confused about that. Now, how did we find out that the minus 35 region had TTG ACA? How did we find out that minus 10 is called the Tata box? And it's through an experiment that's incredibly popular in molecular biology. It's called footprinting or DNA footprinting. So what you do is you have DNA. And in this case, I would add sigma factors to it. So I'd have my sigma factors, I'd add that to DNA and they would bind to make a complex, right? My sigma factor would be bound to my DNA. Then you basically just chop up all the DNA, right? Once you have your sigma factors bound to DNA, you just chop up all the DNA that's left and you let that happen. Then you remove the sigma factors and you see what DNA is left over, what DNA is not being chopped up. And the idea is this sigma factor, when it's bound to DNA, it's gonna be protecting it from being chopped up. So once we let it release again, that DNA will be intact, we can sequence it and we can figure out, okay, this sequence of the DNA binds the sigma factor. That, that technique is used for like any single protein that binds DNA. If you wanna know where it binds to, uh, you do footprinting, uh, very simple experiment. Right, so any questions about what's on this slide or any of the information presented here? All right, if not, we can move on. If you are typing on a question, feel free to continue and I will get to it when it pops up. Okay, so we talked about initiation. Let's just briefly talk about the actual genes. Um, this is probably review if you've taken molecular cell bio already. Um, so we're not gonna dive too much into it, um, but when we talk about genes, there's a difference between the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes. So for eukaryotes, when we make RNA, it's usually only for one gene. And we call that monocystronic. Like this will make one protein. While for prokaryotes, their genes are often just connected together. And this with their controls, so like the promoter and the operator are called the operon. And so what um, prokaryotes do is that their RNA will just have multiple genes on it. So their uh, genes are called polycystronic which means one RNA makes multiple proteins. So that's, that's the main difference in genes when you're talking between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, one, one RNA, one protein. Prokaryotes, one RNA, multiple proteins. That's just your little review on genes. I'm, and we're not gonna talk like much more about the operon system itself. Like I said, that's more for molecular cell bio. Just wanted to uh, jock your memory on that. What we are gonna talk about is what's kind of going on structurally here. So when the sigma unit is going to bind on the promoter, 
what it does is that it kind of reaches across our whole claw. And when it does that, it makes our, um, our, our claw close. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go back and just remind you, like this is what we're talking about with our claw and I'm just gonna wait, do my little doodle again. And hopefully, perfect. So there's our uh, RNA P. And when the sigma, you know, binds, it's kind of going to go across this whole complex. It's kind of like, it's a protein, right? So it's kind of, kind of like going to extend. And then it will cause these jaws to close. And when those jaws or pincers close, you form the closed complex and DNA is going to be like bound very tight. In the RNA P, it's not going to be come off, not going to come off. So uh, bound to DNA tight in this position. All right. To begin, we have the sigma um, sigma factor opening up the minus ten element. That's how we get our bubble. And remember, that's called the uh, Tata box or the Prinbao box. And hopefully, once I say that sentence, that that's where we're gonna open DNA, that makes sense as to why the sequence is T-A-T-A-A-T, -A -A -T, right? Remember T-A, whoops, has two hydrogen bonds, G-C has three. So it's much easier to open up a sequence of T A T A T A T A than it is G C G C G C G C, right? T A is held together uh, weaker than G C. So if we want to start opening up DNA, that's what we're going to do with that. And there I have a question. Um, most of RNA P is negative. There, however, it does interact with DNA. So what's the likely charge of amino acids? And I'll just go ahead and answer that. So where we're interacting with our DNA, we will want positive amino acids, right? So anywhere we're gonna be interacting with that DNA. Remember DNA is negative because of the phosphate backbone. We're gonna have just have positive amino acids helping to move that DNA across. Now, like I was saying in the previous slide, um, different sigma factors will recognize different promoter sequences. And this gives the cell some control over what genes it wants to make, right? So at any given time, you can have a different, uh, a different set of sigma factors. And this will change during development and cell differentiation where you'll just make these different sigma factors and make different genes. And that's actually a really clever way to control which genes are being described or uh, uh, not described, uh, transcribed. Now, talking about RNAP, I said that when the jaws close, you bind the DNA really tight. That's actually a problem because Sometimes you have this abortive ignition where RNAP will just create, will go across the DNA like nine to 10 nucleotides, but the sigma factor is bound so tight, you're not gonna leave the promoter region. So you kind of just like making RNA go, oh wait, I'm stuck, I'm stuck because I'm still bond the DNA so tight. And then that RNA is just going to, you know, leave the RNA P uh, incomplete because it's only nine nucleotides, and you will have to start all over again. You have to uh, unbound, uh, unbind, rebind, and kind of just start again. So this actually happens a fair amount of the time. Uh, this abortive ignition, where you're just bound so tight, uh, you can't move. All right, so. 
Any questions about this slide or anything we've gone over up to this point? Right. Transcription bubble same, stays the same size always. Um, once you get the DNA opened and you're moving through the DNA, yeah, the bubble size itself will always be about the same, same, uh, about the same size. Yeah, it's not like it's going to shrink um, because there are, um, amino acids in, in your RNA P that's helping to hold the, the DNA open. So yeah. The bubble inside RNA P is mostly gonna stay the same size. All right, let's, let's go on here. So after we have bound to the sigma factor to our um, promoter, and let's say that our DNA was actually able to remove, be removed from the promoter, we're gonna continue DNA synthesis five prime to three prime. 100% same as DNA, right? It just goes five prime to three prime. Um, and as was asked in like the previous question, um, yeah, the transcription bubble is going to remain open during this. And so the RNA P is just going to move along. And of course, this, this cartoon is a little ridiculous in that the RNA P is so tiny compared to DNA. Um, but I think it's just trying to say, you know, here's our template, our antisense strand rather. We're making RNA from it, which is green. And this bubble is going to be opening. I think this picture on the left is much better at showing that. DNA is going to be continuously fed in in that direction. And that bubble will just remain open. So once DNA en enters here, bubble opens. Then once it gets back out to here, uh, bubble can close. And like I alluded to earlier, we're making that DNA RNA hybrid duplex. So the question is though, I was talking about abortive uh, initiation. Why does the actual RNAP actually leave the promoter then in some instances? Um, and the idea is it's due to underwinding and overwinding. And what that means is that the DNA in front of RNAP is overwound, it's getting very tight, while the DNA behind it is underwound, is very loose. Because remember, these are two, these are two like strands of string coiling around each other. And what's going to happen is that this will try to relax or loosen. Well, this will try the tighten. And that is thought to provide the energy to propel RNAP. It's this, uh, it's basically just physics. Uh, one side is trying to loosen, the other side is trying to tight. And if you're in the middle of that, you're going to be pushed by the side that is tightening and follow the side that's underwinding. And RNAP is also helping with that because it is opening up your DNA to help with that, uh, the whole winding issue. So yeah, that is how uh, RNAP is traveling across the DNA there. So any questions about that idea?
Now let's actually look at a gene that's being transcribed. And that's what this image is, sh is being shown down here. Now, transcription itself of RNA is actually pretty slow. Um, it is about 20 times to 50 times slower than making DNA. And the error rate is actually really high. Uh, for RNA polymerase, you're gonna make an error every 10,000 nucleotides. And for DNA polymerase, you know, you're looking at like every 100 million to like a trillion nucleotides, you're gonna make an error. So that's why I have this question. Just speaking in evolutionary terms, why does it seem okay for an RNA polymerase to have a higher mutation rate than DNA polymerase? That is why, like evolutionary speaking, has this not been corrected? Why does RNA polymerase not have the same type of proofreading as DNA polymerase? Why has that never happened? There seems to be no, no pressure to make that happen, no evolutionary pressure to make that happen. Why? because of selective pressure or environmental pressure of the organism so they can be able to change faster, uh, like some errors can lead to advantages. So I think you're both kind of saying the same thing. And that is true if we're talking about DNA. What happens if you make an error in your RNA transcription process? Well, the only thing you're gonna change is the proteins directly made from that RNA. And then that RNA will be destroyed. And the next time you transcribe it, it'll be the correct version or it should be. So the idea here is if you make an error in RNA, you might like screw up a few copies of a protein, but that's okay. You still have like, the good copy of DNA. So you can just make that RNA again. If you make an error in DNA, that is permanent. There's no going back from that if you do not repair it like we talked about uh, last week. Um, so that's why like, if you're just talking about evolutionary pressure, if you make an error one, hour, one every 10,000 times for RNA polymerase, I mean, you might change an amino acid temporarily but if you had that same error rate in DNA, you're gonna be mutating crazy amounts, right? So for example, E. coli has like 3 million nucleotides. And if you mutate one every 10,000 nucleotides, that is what, 30,000? That can't be right. Uh, 3,000, is that right? I can't do math in my head right now. Uh, that'd be like 300 uh, mutations per, per duplication. That's a crazy amount of mutations for DNA because that would be permanent. So RNA can just tolerate, tolerate it because it is transient. It doesn't exist for that long. RNA is a little brother that gets outcast and no one cares if he makes mistakes. Well, it's even worse than that because RNA is not even like the little brother because it gets chewed up, right? It just gets destroyed after a while. You know, after 20 minutes, it just gets killed. So at least the little brother is allowed to stay alive. The RNA is, is destroyed. So who cares if it makes a mistake? We're gonna kill it anyways, right? That's the idea there. Now, when we look at some genes, and so let's just focus on the one in the middle because um, it's already labeled the initiation site and termination site. Some genes are, are needed to um, 
be constantly transcribed. And these are constitutive enzymes. You know, think of the enzymes that if you did not have these, you would die. So they need to be made all the time. And so they're gonna be, RNA polymerase is always gonna be on it in multiple copies as well. Basically, RNA polymerase, a new RNA polymerase is going to bind as soon as that initiation site is open, right? As soon as one RNA polymerase leaves, another one comes right on and then it'll move across the DNA. And what is seen and what they call is that you have this arrowhead. What all of these lines are, that's an RNA. So each one of these lines is a different piece of RNA being created. That just tells you, and, and if you look, if you focus in on this image, compare the middle there, all those dark spots to the termination site. They're both DNA. So you're comparing this versus that. All of those dark spots are RNA polymerase. So you can just see how many versions of RNA polymerase are on there. So some genes, constitutive uh, genes, they're just always on, they're always being transcribed as soon as possible. While other genes are inducible. This would be like the lac operon, that they're only created under certain circumstances. So if an E. coli comes across lactose, then it'll start transcribing the lactose operon, right? Um, but something like, I don't know, catalase, what catalase does is that it removes hydrogen peroxide. Um, and that is from aerobic metabolism. So you're always gonna want that around. Otherwise, you know, you can't take care of hydrogen peroxide, which is uh, dangerous to us. Or anything that takes care of free radicals like superoxide dismutase. Um, don't worry about memorizing that or anything, but that's another enzyme that works on free radicals. So we need that all the time. All right, so any questions about um, this information? All right. Now, how do we actually stop this thing? Because remember I said when sigma binds, the claw closes and then DNA is like trapped. DNA can't leave anymore. You have closed around your DNA double strand. So we need to end this somehow. And there are two different types of ways to end RNA transcription. One is called an intrinsic terminator. And it's called intrinsic because the terminator's in the DNA sequence, right? So this is termination uh, due to DNA sequence. So what are we looking for for intrinsic termination in E. coli? Um, basically, you're just looking for a bunch of AT base pairs with a bunch of A's on your template. So the T's would be on the sense strand and the A's are on the uh, nonsense strand or your template. Template. And right after that, you have palindromic GC region. So there you go. So bunch of GCs uh, that, that follow right up after that. And what happens when you do this is that you're gonna form what's called a hairpin. So here, oh, sorry, I just realized I'm an idiot. I wrote the wrong GC sequence. Sorry about that. I was going to say that doesn't look like a palindrome. 
So it's this GT sequence. So this is that. I apologize. So GC is before the ATs, not after. And what's going to happen is that when all these GCs are created, the RNA is going to bind with itself. So you're going to have this, what's called a hairpin. So a hairpin is any RNA structure that forms a loop to hydrogen bond with itself. It's super common in RNA, incredibly common. So you form this hairpin with a bunch of U's. And once this happens, the RNA polymerase gets stuck. It can't move anymore. This hairpin's like a, like a wedge that's holding the RNA polymerase right in place. Then the RNA polymerase has to come off the DNA. We're not gonna talk about that. Lots of steps, lots of enzymes. So we're just kind of going to gloss over that fact for now and just say, yeah, yeah, RNA P comes off. But that's one, one way to do it is this intrinsic terminator. The other way to do it is through row factor. So half of the sites use that intrinsic terminator. Half the sites use what's called row. And rho is just a protein. So it's a protein called rho factor, and that's being shown uh, down here. And what it does is that it just helps to speed up spontaneous termination. So once rho is present at a location, it's going to make RNAP just stop working. And the way that this works is that you will have some sequence in the DNA that when tra transcribed to RNA, this, this, will, um, this will go and make a uh, row bind. So the idea is, you know, here's my DNA, my RNAP is right here. And I made, I made RNA. And this RNA will attract rho. And once this rho is bound to RNA, that will make RNAP just stop working. Uh, do any sites use both of them together or is there just no need? Um, that's a good question. I don't actually know off the top of my head if you have both row sites with an intrinsic terminator. I would say there's probably no need because the way it sounds to me is that you know these systems just popped up naturally and there was just two systems that both seemed to work, uh, the intrinsic terminator and the row site. Um, and so genes just had one or the other. That being said, it would not surprise me that it is possible to have both. Like there might be some genes out there that have both. Um, I would just say, it's probably rare that would happen, right? Because thinking about it on an evolutionary uh, evolutionary uh, uh, you know, timeline, if this gene is already stopping, then there's no need to incorporate like a row factor, right? Or there's no need to incorporate intrinsic termination if it's already stopping on its own. Um, that would be my sense, but I actually don't know 100%. Right, so that picture is basically, you know, how it works. And I find this kind of funny uh, because I was a big fan of Scooby-Doo growing up. The DNA sequence that um, encodes for row binding is called RUT. So RUT row, yeah, 
whoever made that had a very good sense of humor. So like you have the rut, which is the DNA sequence. So it's called for row utilization sites. I, 100% this, this was called row. And then whoever found it thought, oh, I'm gonna be hilarious and call it this rut, rut row. Um, so these rut sites have um, overabundance in C. And I'm gonna have to double check this because I do not know what rich in C and poor in G would actually, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I know exactly what that means now. Um, I was thinking in terms of double-stranded DNA, but remember my mistake. We only care about single-strand DNA here because this would only be on the nonsense strand. So on the nonsense strand, there's a bunch of Cs and like no Gs. So on the RNA, it's gonna be a bunch of Gs then. And once you have rut, you're going to uh, um, call over row once you make the RNA. Right, so any questions about the rut row system? Right, and that ends prokaryotes. So now we're gonna look at RNA transcription in eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are of course um, more complex. And so we get three different versions of RNA polymerase, while pro prokaryotes just had one. So they're named one, two, and three. And their names um, not only say where they're located, um, but also kind of what they do. So RNA P1 are in the nucleoli. Um, the nucleoli is basically where um, ribosomes are made. So RNA P1, that's going to handle your ribosomal RNA, our RNA. RNA-P2 um, is in the nucleoplasm, and that's going to make your mRNA. RNA-P3, that's going to make uh, some of your rRNA as well. That's going to take care of all your tRNAs. And then other small nuclear and cytosolic RNAs can also uh, be made. And we do have a separate RNA for our mitochondria. Plants have a separate one for their chloroplasts as well, which makes sense. If you remember um, back to our discussion on the mitochondria like a month or two ago, um, the mitochondria, most of the proteins made for the mitochondria are actually made in the nucleus, except for like 10 proteins. There are 10 mitochondria proteins that are so hydrophobic you can't make them in the cytoplasm. So the mitochondria still has to make like 10 proteins by itself. And so we have to make RNA P's for that. Last line there, RNA P's are attractive targets for antibodies and other drugs, right? Because the idea there is um, RNA P's are, one, if we're talking about a bacterial issue, uh, eukaryotic and prokaryotic RNAPs are different. So stop the prokaryotic one. You'll care the, kill the prokaryotes and leave the eukaryotic cells alive. But also for like cancer cells, um, cancer cells are always like replicating. They're always making new proteins. So their RNAPs are working a lot, right? They're always like doing the arrowhead stuff. So you block RNAP, that's a, one way you could shut down cancer cells. Of course, like most cancer treatments, um, you're also gonna hurt healthy cells um, as well. Now let's look 
at our eukaryotic uh, polymerases here. And much like the prokaryotic, they're massive. In fact, they're, they are bigger than prokaryotic and also way more complex. But they have the same like claw slash forehead look. Let me get to my black pen. Um, don't worry about the tith and tack RNA piece. Just know like, oh, they, they more or less look the same. So more complex, but the same kind of shape. The, just like the um, prokaryotic RNAP, if we look at the active site, which is shown by that nice little black DNA, the reason, by the way, um, that we just have a black circle for DNA there is because whoever made this, like in an experiment, couldn't get DNA to bind. So this is the best we have. Um, so near the active site, we have magnesiums. And who can tell me why you would have magnesiums uh, near the active site of this enzyme? Because what molecule are we interacting with and what charge does that molecule have? Shielding, uh, that would work, yeah. Um, because we are, we are bringing like DNA together. We are making RNA, making new, new, um, uh, phosphate backbones. And if you remember with the DNA polymerase, uh, magnesium there is helping to bring the phosphates together, position them and shield their negative charge. So we're doing the same thing here with RNA polymerase. We're helping to bring that RNA together creating new RNA uh, phosphate bonds, all very negative. So the magnesium is helping to not only position the RNA, but shield that negative charge, right? And even the binding cleft, we have a lot of positive charge. Now, what's interesting when you talk about the eukaryotic polymerase is that in the C-terminal domain, and by the way, anytime you see CTD for a protein, that means C terminal domain. If you would see NTD, that would be N terminus domain. So our RNAP has 52 repeats of the sequence PTS, PSYS. So it's just this seven amino acids copied 52 times. And the idea is these serines can be phosphorylated by different kinases or removed by phosphatases. And this is how we control RNA polymerase. So if those serines don't have a phosphate on them, then we can do initiation. And only when those serines have been phosphorylated do we do elongation? It's almost like a, a check for like when airplanes are gonna take off, they have to do all these checks, right? And then the pilot gets to hear all these checks and once they get all green lights, it's okay, we're ready for takeoff. Here, it's the same thing. It's the cell's way of saying, okay, before we make RNA, it's like, is every all the machinery ready to go and in the right place? If so, let's start phosphorylating these serines that's our green light for elongation. So it's a cool little code that's going on there, which is you know, common for a lot of proteins. As we saw um, when we were talking about metabolism, this idea of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation is really just turning on and turning off things. Does the C terminus domain help cap the DNA? Um, so, this, this would be um, RNA polymerase, not DNA polymerase. Um, and we will be talking about capping the mRNA, if not next, if not Thursday, then Tuesday. So we'll get to that question, not in this lecture, but we will talk, go over the whole capping method of RNA, um, either next lecture or Tuesday. We'll hold on to that one. All right. 
All right, so let's look at what happens when we're doing elongation. And this, like I said, we're gonna kind of dive into this and it's kind of complex. There's there's a lot of like terminology here. Um, so, so let's work through this. Uh, during this, your friend is gonna be this image on the right. All right, it's a cartoon version of what's going on here. All right, so when we have our DNA bound, we're going to be doing the same thing as in prokaryotes. We need to close our claws or our clamp and like close on the DNA to make sure the DNA can't leave. Um, the clamp, the technical name for the clamp is called RPB2, uh, but you know, you can just call it the clamp because it closes. Once the clamp is closed, um, DNA is not falling off. DNA is not like trapped in there. You are holding on. So DNA is going, going through. Once it goes through, we have just a wall and that's what it's called. We have the wall, which is just amino acids, just protein. And what the wall does is that it makes DNA take a 90 degree turn because DNA comes in, comes in, whoops, there's probably a bunch of negative charge here. I'm going to go the other way, right? And when that happens, the wall is going to force the active site to point towards the floor. So we're going to have our base pointing downwards. And when we have that, I guess it's actually in this picture, it would be right here, but we're pointing downwards. That allows us to base pair now with RNA. So now I'm gonna skip the middle part to just go to here since I'm talking about it. Um, am I talking about it? Sorry, that's the next slide. I apologize, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're, we're pointing, pointing our DNA downwards, which is allowing our RNA to bind. And this is all being coordinated through DNA RNA backbone interactions, right? Because no matter what base you have, the backbone is always the same as the phosphate. So you're just gonna be, uh, have positive amino acids there. And what's going to happen is that for a correct connection to be made, you have to make um, the Watson-Crick base pairs, right? So if the DNA is T, then oh, I wrote an A, sorry. So if the DNA is A, then only you for RNA will make the correct base pairs and only you will be added. So you're going to be doing that. And the next slide, we're actually going to look more into that. And then the DNA and RNA are gonna come up and you have what's called the rudder. Again, the rudder is just like a piece of protein that sticks out and it's gonna stick out like a wedge to break the DNA RNA double bond. And the RNA is gonna be directed in one direction, this direction, and the DNA is gonna be in the opposite direction where it can just uh, reform into a duplex. And kind of directing a lot of this is what is called the bridge, which is down here. So the bridge is going to be contacting the DNA at the base I plus one. And so the I is basically just saying like, um, what nucleotide you're working on? Like what number are you on in the process? Am I on number one? Am I number at 400? So like if I'm reading my 400th nucleotide, my DNA, that means I'm gonna be connecting at 401. So it's just one more than what the DNA we're working on. And this bridge has a little bend in it and what that, what's that is going to do 
It's, it's kind of going to shape the DNA from the plus one to the minus one position, leaving an I plus one empty for a nucleotide to come in. So let me say that in a little simpler terms. The bridge is just like opening up a space between the enzyme and the DNA for a new nucleotide to come in. That's probably the simplest way to say it. That's all it does. Um, this stuff is what's in your book. So if I was gonna explain it to somebody on the street, I'll just say, yeah, so it has this bridge, um, pushes against the DNA, so it opens up a space for the new nucleotide to bind. And that brings us on to the next page, which is a continuation of this. And when we look at the RNA polymerase, there are two sites that really matter. And it's called the E site and the A site. E is for entry, A is for addition. So once we have the DNA in there, and we have the bridge pushing against the DNA, opening up that space for a new nucleotide to bind. The nucleotide triphosphate, remember that's what NTP stands for. They will go into the E site first. And at this point, RNA polymerase doesn't know which nucleotide should go in. So any NTP, any RNA NTP, I should say, can go into the entry site. So there's a 25% chance that the correct one will go in. So 75% of the time, it's wrong. This is why it is so slow, one of the reasons, compared to DNA polymerase, right? Because 75% of the time, wrong nucleotide binds or enters E site. Once you're in the E site, you go into the A site, which is addition. However, this will only work if you are correct. So if the wrong nucleotide goes into the E site and tries to go to the A site, you're not gonna form our Watson Crick base pairs and so you're gonna be kicked out and then new nucleotide binds. However, if you do have the right Watson Crick base pairs, you're gonna uh, trigger a, a chain reaction through what's called the trigger loop. Um, and the way I kind of think of it, it's like, I don't know, for some reason I'm thinking of it like a stapler where it'll just like come down and like a stapler combines sheets of paper together, this will just combine RNAs together. Like, and you create that phosphate bond. And this trigger only works for RNA. So if you have, you need that two prime OH, that's part of the interaction that's happening. And you need the correct nucleotide. Once you have all that, you'll make a bunch of connections, a bunch of hydrogen bonds, triggering the trigger loop, snapping together and making new RNA. And I believe that is where we're gonna stop for today. So any questions about RNA polymerase? Two. Um, and I know, I'm, I'm sure this is just one of those slides, like a lot of stuff in this class, um, that you will probably just need to look at a couple times and talk yourself through maybe make your own like diagram about like what's happening. So I'll, I'll say the big points here, make sure you know what the wall does. The wall is making the DNA go 90 degrees. The clamp closes across the DNA. The rudder separates DNA from RNA. The bridge makes space for new nucleotides to enter. 
the E site is where new nucleotides enter. The A site is where they interact with DNA. If the correct Watson base pair is made, the trigger loop forms that new phosphate bond. If you can repeat that back to me, um, you're good. So that's probably the simplest way I can boil it down. The reading guide was tough. Um, yeah. Keep in mind, um, if you had a physical book, you are, you know, basically at the end of a biochemistry textbook. So yeah, I, I understand it, it is quite difficult, not easy stuff. But hopefully you're, you, you feel your mind getting stronger by doing this. All right, so one last chance for questions about this. I mean, you can always email me, but while I'm here. All right. If there's not, um, that's all I have. So I'll put up uh, a homework. Uh, do next week, Tuesday, that covers this stuff. Um, so just a reminder for those of you who came a little later, we do have another test next week, Thursday. I apologize. Watch the YouTube video and I'll give, just watch the first like minute of that, uh, go over details of that. Um, but I'll talk more about that every single lecture leading up to it. Otherwise, let me know if you have questions via email and I hope you have a good rest of your week. Only two more weeks to go for regular class. Hang in there. We're almost done. All right. See everybody later. Oh, and.